Hi, friends. <laughs> I, I swear to you, this is the most cursed episode of all time. This is at least the 20th time. That's not hyperbole. It's not also not an exact count. But this has got to be at least the 20th time. I know for a fact that the first day I sat to record this, that I tried five times. And since then, just all sorts of things have happened. And right now, I just recorded this whole episode and it didn't record on my phone. <laughs> oh my word, what is happening? Ha! <laughs> ah. So, let me tell you what this episode was originally going to be. And then I'll tell you what it is. And then I'll do it. Originally, I was going to sit down, I was going to sit down with the tribes of Etruigan, uh, Gazetteer number 14, and I was going to roll up a character. While I was doing that, well, first of all, I did my little rant. And, uh, but all sorts of things happened. And I, like I said, I had to record that one at least five times. And eventually I just said, screw it. I'm not doing it. <laughs> and so the next week I recorded just the quick little, my reaction to the intelligence and wisdom modifiers. And I'm going to do a whole follow-up episode on that. I had some good comments come in um, on YouTube and uh, voicemail and uh, email or two that people requested I not give their name, so I won't. Um, yeah, so I did that one and then I said, I'll do this one. And then my notes got lost and I had these graphics because I was going to, and those got lost. And um, was going to record on Saturday and we had a Nile Horan concert to go to. Eh, whatever. <laughs> um, don't judge. I see you judging. Don't judge. Um, so that got pushed back. And like I said, I just sat down, I recorded it all and it didn't record. I swear this, this is a cursed episode. All right. So anyway, so that's what it was supposed to be. What it's going to turn out being is I'm going to take that character that I made <laughs> for one of the recordings that didn't work. And I'm just going to walk us through it. And then this episode is going to get the lightest ever of edits. And then I'm going to push it out. And you're going to like it, dang it. <laughs> ah, yeah, okay. Let's do it. If you hear the crinkling of the paper, um, that's, that's my notes. This is because I already made this character. Um, first time I did it, I had my dice here. I would roll them up. <clears throat> Whatever. All right. It's a D&D &D character, it's basic D&D, &D. it's the Alsting era, so it's Rule Cyclopedia, all that fun stuff. The stats, so two of the stats we said we roll 4d6, drop low, that's strength and constitution, so those ended up as 10 and 16. Two of the stats, intelligence and wisdoms, are, were roll 4d6, drop the high, those ended up as 13 and 12. And you know, I came up with a way that one of bothered me for the stat adjustments. Again, it wasn't the stat adjustment itself that bothered me. I get why you're doing it from a gaming perspective. If they just said, we're doing it for gaming reasons, I would have been okay. But rather than saying that they are intellectually challenged or, or whatever word they use, they're just, oh, so cringe. If they had said, because characters generated in this book are so young, because in this book, your character is from 13 to 16. Uh, so they're not fully matured. So for wisdom and intelligence, take the lower. That makes perfect sense. So it's not the rule that bothers me. It's the justification. Um, but. In my mind, I also know that being for basic D&D, their target audience is that 13 to 16 range. So I guess if they didn't want to alienate them and say, you know, lower your intelligence and wisdom because you're so young. Whatever. So anyway, intelligence 12. Nope, lie, lied. Intelligence 13, wisdom 12. Uh, then the other two stats 
our Dex and Charisma. Uh, Dex 12, Charisma 15, just to go through the whole list. Strength 10, Intelligence 13, Wisdom 12, Dex 12, Constitution 16, Charisma 15. Um, so nothing out there, nothing there shouts out a particular class at me. In my mind, I want this character to be a protector. Not necessarily a fighter, though. That's, you know, I want to break the cliche. I want the protector who is behind the scenes. So maybe like a cleric or something. That's my, that was my initial thought when I was making this character. Uh, the book also has a class called the Shamani. It's like shaman with a, I mean, sorry, it's like shaman with an eye, shamani. And so I was thinking about that, but as I looked at it, I'm like, I, I wasn't really feeling it. So I ignored that. Um, the other thing I wanted to think about was the character's uh, gender. So I don't, do I call it he or she? Um, the way I normally do this, unless I have a strong vision that shouts out one or the other, I just say, what did I make last? And I do the opposite. Last character I made was the Minotaur Thief. That was a male. So this one's going to be female. So the next thing in the book is a totem. If you ever watch Star Trek Voyager, this is like the same as Chakotay's spirit animal. Although, do not use Star Trek Voyager for reference for Native American culture. It has issues. Uh, I, I thought this was a neat addition, right? This is something we don't see in a lot of characters and everything. So the first role you do is to do the type. And, you know, I was kind of doing this, and I was telling James what was happening as I was making the character, and he said, I don't like those types. Because James, you know, James wants a wolf or a bear or actually probably not or anything that's whenever you run into James it's wolf or bear those are his favorite animals in the world so he wanted a chart that says wolf bear hawk eagle I don't know what else he would he would like but this isn't like that this is like mammal avian fish stuff like that and I personally I like stuff like this because I it's not, it's not as limited, right? A table, I mean, a D, even as of a D100 table, you're only going to have 100 possibilities. Whereas this, this is every animal in the world. I like that freedom. James doesn't. James thinks that's too open. Same thing when it comes to equipment. James wants equipment packs because he doesn't want to make that decision because there's all these items and it's just too much for him. It's Analysis paralysis, I call it, right? He wants, like, just to pick between these four packs. But that's him. That, nothing wrong with that, right? Just different people looking at the world differently. So anyway, one thing I will say in James's favor, though, uh, like one other thing on the chart is mollusk. Who wants a mollusk for a... <laughs> for a, a totem? A clam? A crayfish? Well, I mean, what? Actually, crayfish might be kind of cool. The funny thing about this. Hmm. If I were to recreate this game today, instead of having those choices, I would have it be land animal, sea animal, air animal. So much easier in my mind. But anyway, so I rolled the dice, and it says because this is so integral to your character's identity, you roll twice, and you pick the one you like the best. So I rolled, and I rolled mammal. Like, cool. I was probably okay with that anyway, because I was going to go with the mammal. And I rolled again, mammal. So my choices was mammal or mammal. I picked mammal. <clears throat> the next role it has you do is what kind of mammal. Again, not what kind like bear or wolf, but what kind like, is it a omnivore? Is it a carnivore? Is it an herbivore? I rolled an herbivore. So I was like, an, herb, an herbivore mammal, what do I want to pick? And again, James always thinks things like wolf, bear, right? Um, <clears throat> so I was thinking it would be cute to go as opposite as James as I could, but being an herbivore, you're kind of going to have to go anyway. But still, like a big elk with the antlers or a deer, you know, a stag, that's still, it's cliche. I want it to go the other way. I want to, I like to subvert exp expectations. And I was like, oh, what about a chipmunk? Chipmunks are adorable. Um, 
I have some in my yard. I don't see them right now though. And squirrels, I'm like squirrels. And so I'm going through all these animals, but then I remember, so a lot of these uh, clans, as they call them in the book, they seem to be based on the Western clan, uh, the Western tribes, uh, as opposed to the, uh, the like East Coast tribes, like the Algonquin and all those. Uh, and so then I said, okay, well, let me think about something from the plains or out there. And I remembered when I lived in Oklahoma, there was this park where you could go and <clears throat> like underground and pop up in this tunnel, uh, you know, with a little glass dome and be right next to the prairie dogs. It wasn't a zoo or anything. They weren't trapped there. This just happened to be a field where the prairie dogs lived and they made it a park and you could go there. I love the prairie dogs. And I said I wanted to be a protector. And it seemed like almost like meerkats, right? Prairie dogs are up there and they're looking around. I'm like, I like that. I like the image. It's like a guardian. It's a protector. It's a watcher. I like that. Yes. So uh, her totem is a prairie dog. All right. So the next step is the character's age. Age is 12 plus 1d4. So your age is going to be 13 to 16. I rolled a 2. She's 14. The next roll was this little chart. And you roll on it and you add your age. And you roll on it for your mother and your father, and it tells you if they're, you know, if they're healthy, if they're unhealthy, well, sickly, I guess you would say, or if they're like dead. So I rolled, and my mom is dead. And I rolled, and my dad is dead. And we always joke about people who make these orphan characters, and I usually try not to. I try very hard not to. And Sure enough, I got an orphan character. But then it says also to do that for your grandparents. So you have two parents, but you have four grandparents. So I had to roll, and this time you add twice your age. So I had to roll. I'm like, well, definitely they're going to be dead because the, the age modifier is even higher. The higher the roll, the more likely they are to be dead. But no, all four grandparents are alive. The mother's mother is in poor health. The rest are in good health. Go figure. Uh, so my mind now, great. She's there, she's being orphaned at a young age uh, and had to grow up with her uh, grandparents, probably on her father's side, because that's the one where both are healthy. You know, that's, that's the story that's, that's coming to my mind. Uh, how do the parents die? I'm thinking of famine right now. Spoiler, that's not what happens. Um, but those aren't roles, that's just decision, that's story-based. All right, so the next step is siblings so first thing is number of siblings you roll 1d6 exploding i rolled 1d6 i rolled a six so i modify the rule on the fly here because one thing i don't like about the normal to the traditional um exploded dice is that you well is that it's impossible to roll a six in this case right because if you roll a five it's a five if you roll a six you have to re-roll and add it. So if you, even if you roll a one, the number is seven. So you can have five or you can have seven. You can never have six. So I modified it to be when you re-roll, it's five plus a new roll. And if that was six, then it's five plus et cetera, et cetera. But the next one wasn't six. So I rolled a six and then I rolled a five. But because I was subtracting one, that's ten siblings. Whew, that's a lot. And it's especially a lot because now for each sibling, you have to roll a die to say if they're older or younger, if they're a brother or a sister, that's the second roll, you have to roll to see how much older or younger they are. And every time you roll, there's a new modifier <coughs> to try to prevent collisions. If there is a collision, you have to roll to see if they're a twin. And you have to roll to see, uh, just like the other, the parents, only there's no modifier for this one, if they're alive or dead or sickly. So that's four rolls per sibling. And if there's two of the same age, you have to roll again to see if they're twins, but we won't. With 10 siblings, that was 40 rolls I had to make. And I'm just gonna go read through this list. She has a 21-year-old brother, a 20-year-old sister, who is in poor health. If I don't say they're in poor health, that means they're in good health. She also has a 20-year-old brother. Those two 20-year-olds are twins. She has an 18-year-old brother, a 16-year-old sister. 
That's all the older siblings. Now the younger siblings. She has an 11-year-old brother who is in poor health. She has a 10-year-old sister, an 8-year-old sister, an 8-year-old brother, and a 6-year-old sister. The other problem I have with so many siblings is that it's hard to have a backstory where you have all these elements coming in, right? I don't want a 20-page backstory. So, as you'll see when I get to the backstory, I ignored them all except for one of them. All right, so next was class and clan. And I mentioned them together because they, they go kind of hand in hand. Because not that like all the thieves are in this clan and all the clerics are in that clan or anything like that. Just because within each clan, they view each class differently. So when you find the clan, you look at the class and you look at how they're viewed there. But there's also a general section. Now we're looking at all the classes. And like I said, I don't want to do fighter. That's, it's cliche. It's old. It's tired. It's not in general. For this type of char character I'm thinking, for the protector, I, I want to subvert expectations with this character. So when I say she's a protector... She's not a gold fighter. Plus the prairie dog, that's not an attack animal, right? That's a watch. And uh, ranger might work, but they don't have rangers in this game. Uh, druid, maybe, but it's weird how you make a druid. Um, so like I said, I looked at the shamani. It didn't really talk to me. A cleric, I was second place thing. Uh, magic user, it didn't really fit. But when I read the description of the thief, I don't have it here. It said that the clans look at the thieves pretty much as scouts. Uh, the word they have for them is he who looks ahead. I'm like, that fits the prairie dog thing perfectly, right? They go ahead, they see what dangers are there, and they come back and they report. They look for tread. Yeah, that's it. That's my vision. That is what I am thinking for, for this character. Um, and it fits the prairie dog motif. And so then I'm looking through all the clans and looking at how they're viewing uh, the thief. You know, I thought a lot about the turtle clan because they're like the maritime clan. And I, as I said many, many times, <laughs> I grew up in that paradise that was known as Rhode Island. And that's a, you know, that's a coastal state. So there's uh, maritime stuff in my blood. So I thought about that, but they said, eh, they don't really care about the thieves. Then there was the horse clan, but they, they don't have a spoken language, right? They, they use gestures all the time. I said, I don't want to deal with that. And so I'm looking at all the clans, and then I come across the elk clan. And it says this. Nowhere are the stealthful skills of the thief more appreciated than they are among the children of the elk. Many of their legendary warriors have in reality been members of the thief class. Because of this, all Elk Clan thieves gain a bonus of 5% to their earned experience. This is an, is an addition to any bonus they receive for unusually high ability scores. I don't care about the experience point bonus. Um, it's the rest. I like it. fits. It works. Uh, warrior, but I'm not a warrior, right? Viewed as a warrior, a protector... Scout, it, it, that's it. She is an Elk Clan Scout. So Children of the Elk. Uh, the other clan, by the way, is uh, Children of the Tiger. They're kind of the, the orcs. They're not orcs in race. One of the things I like about this setting is that it's all human. Uh, but uh, in culture, they, they are the bad tribe. So I didn't want to be that because that's not me. Uh, years ago, there was a video game called City of Heroes and there was the other part called City of Villains. I refuse to play City of Villains. I refuse to play a villain. <laughs> it's, I, I won't do it. So the last thing, well two last things I guess, skills and backstory. So skills, um, this again is the Alsting era of basic Dungeons and Dragons and they had a skill system that was in the rule cyclopedia but that actually started in the Gazetteers before there was a uh, rule cyclopedia or anything like that. So some of the... Oh, yeah, that's the other thing. It says, yeah, use skills, use skills, but it doesn't reprint them at all. 
So if you want to use the skills, you either have to buy Rule Cyclopedia, which wasn't out when this book was published, or you have to buy some other gazetteer that had it, like the Elf one. Whatever. So the skills I picked were tree walking, A, that fits into our backstory, and B, that goes with that scout mentality. Survival, the, the book said everyone should have survival. Tracking, the fit. Alertness, definitely. In danger sense, again, that prairie dog thing. Yeah, that's why I picked Dangerous Sense. All right, mechanically, that's the character. The only thing left is the backstory. You know, I don't even need my notes for the backstory. I know this backstory, especially having done this episode 20 million times. <sighs> okay, her backstory. Like I said, she's 14. Uh, she's in this South Clan village. It's the same village that she grew up in. And... You know, she has parents, she has 10 siblings, at least when she's born. And one day, two years ago, two or three, I keep changing it. Uh, she's like 12, that makes her younger sister four. The village is raided by the children of the tiger. And, you know, everything goes to heck. And during the raid... Her parents are captured. She's captured. Her youngest sister is captured. Uh, again, if she only, if there were only like three kids, I probably would have done it with all of them. Too many moving parts. I'm not going to deal with ten. So I focused on the youngest. Uh, I named her Little Sparrow. Is the sister's name. Uh, so she would have been four at this time. Uh, they're captured. About. I can't math today. <laughs> About 12 or 13 other people are captured uh, too. And so the tiger, the children of the tiger, take their captives and they're doing like a forced march from their village to their village. And it's like three days away and they're marching and they're marching. And finally, like on the second day, uh, they let them stop for some rest. And... Our hero, oh, I named her Dancing Squirrel, by the way, uh, because, again, with the tree walking, I figure, uh, you know, she walks on top of the trees a lot, uh, and she has this grace and stuff, and so squirrels walk on trees. That's where she came up with Dancing Squirrel. It's her adult name that was given to her after all this. Uh, so, Dancing Squirrel. So... Dancing Squirrel falls into this sleep. And while she's sleeping, she has a vision of a prairie dog. It's her totem. She doesn't know it yet. She's actually a year too young, a couple years too young at this point to have actually been officially given her totem. But it's going to be her totem, right? So she has a vision of the prairie dog, and it, it reinvigorates. It's the wrong word. Uh, inspires her. And so when she snaps awake from her vision, she starts working her ropes. Right, she's working, she's working, right? they're digging to her wrists and they're cutting her open and she's this big bloody bess, right? I have written the story that uh, her wrists are scarred until this day uh, she rubs them whenever she's anxious or nervous. By the way, she finally gets out, <clears throat> sorry, she finally gets out of her ropes and she starts working on freeing her sister, little sparrow, right? She gets her out and she moves to the next person who's her mother. But just then, uh, a tiger guard uh, notices that they're missing, right? And he starts to raise the alarm and everything. So she has no choice, but she has to scoop up her sister and just book it out of there. And <clears throat> you know, she takes off. And like I said, it took them two days to get there. She's just going on instinct, uh, trying to take care of, you know, at this point, she's... 12. She's trying to take care of this four-year-old sister uh, in the woods, right? I, I called it her journey out of childhood. Um, but, you know, she eventually gets back to her village, and they're all like, oh, you're a hero. You made it. You escaped. You saved your sister. But, you know, internally, she's like, but I left behind my mom. I left behind my dad. There's, there's 13 other people I left behind. And uh, so she has survivor's guilt, right? She has PTSD, um, 
just again that that subverting expectations i thought it would be powerful to play this character if i got to play this character in a game how powerful would that be to be able to play this this 14 year old girl who everyone always thinks is you know sweet and innocent and vulnerable but she has this trauma and uh I, I thought that would be powerful. I thought it would make a, a good character to play. Uh, but that's also a little dark. So I, I end the backstory with a bit that says, you know, now that she's 14, you know, she's she's starting to find her laughter again. She's relating with friends. Uh, although this stuff is still in the back of her mind, she is getting on with life because uh, you don't want it to be too dark. I also say that uh, she and Little Sparrow have this bond uh, that's deeper than sisterhood. Um, really giving the GM some buttons to press there is what that's all about. Uh, you know, saying that the sister while a reminder of the stuff that happened that night is also a reason to live. And, uh, yeah. And so because of that, she's highly motivated as a protector. Uh, she goes out scouting every day. She's going to be the best scout she can be because in her mind, she needs to protect her sister. She needs to protect her village. She needs to protect that is the story of Dancing Squirrel. And that's it for this episode, this cursed episode, which hopefully is finally done. Um, do you like episodes like this? I like them because, A, it's, it's kind of a glimpse into the book, whatever book I use to make the character. I would say the game system, but this is largely D&D. They just some added rules. Overall, I like this, this background generation technique, the, the generation of the uh, family and everything. Uh, I don't like these particular roles I got, but in general, I, I like it. I, it's one of the things I would think about automating uh, as to an online tool, maybe. Uh, yeah, but do you like content like that? Is it is it good listening to, or is it like listening to somebody's gaming story? <clears throat> I don't know. All right, my voice is getting a little hoarse here. I'm going to sign off. Uh, let me know what you think. Feedback at deckahedron.com. Leave comments uh, down below if you're watching this on YouTube, any of the other ways in the show notes or scrolling on your screen right now if you're on YouTube. Uh, thanks again for listening, and until next week, play nice and live nicer. Bye. <laughs>